So YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. As a kind of a concluding piece to the previous two-part series regarding human landings on Mars and what the showstoppers are and what NASA actually thinks of the idea of trying to land on Mars. And uh, in recognition of the fact that right at the moment, NASA is trying out its brand new space launch system, wherein they're going to fire a rocket up above Earth's orbital space zone, turn it round, fire its rocket back down towards Earth so that it can simulate re-entering from the moon or Mars or somewhere else, and then test its re-entry system and see if it can actually slow down and safely stop when it gets back to Earth's orbital zone. I thought we'd have a little bit of a look at the uh, November 2014 Air and Space Smithsonian's coverage of what you could fairly call NASA's Emperor class skyrocket. This is the skyrocket that has no engines. If we have a chance, we'll also have a little bit of a look at NASA's department of being all dressed up with a party dress and no dance to attend, in the sense that when there's no space shuttle, they've got nothing to do with the manned maneuvering unit. We might even have a little bit of a look at why it is that the 1960s vintage Minuteman missile guidance system is still the best there is if you want to drop atom bombs on your neighbor's head. But we'll begin with a few excerpts from an article starting on page 20, titled Bigger Than Saturn, Bound for Deep Space, The New U.S. Rocket is Built to Push Humanity Outward. Begins, on a tour of the Aerojet Rocket 9 assembly buildings at NASA's Stennis Space Center in southern Mississippi, site manager Mike McDaniel stops at a double row of shrouded shapes and big white metal boxes inside a garage-like room. In each is an RS-25, the space shuttle's main engine. With the exception of one more engine to be assembled from spare parts, the room we're standing in holds the entire world supply, 15 in all, of flight-proven, reusable big booster engines. While the value is hard to calculate given that production lines for replacement engines haven't been restarted, bracket, they shut them down about 10 years ago actually, you know what it's like to try and restart a 10-year-old production line? Close bracket. There's certainly more than a billion dollars worth of hardware tucked into a space no bigger than a 7-Eleven. The engines are critical to NASA's next plan for human spaceflight and illustrate an important principle guiding the design of the nation's next booster. Rather than reach for advances in rocketry, engineers are to use proven technology. Get it out of a museum if you have to. The RS-25 engines, which performed almost flawlessly during 135 shuttle launches, bracket, because it wasn't the main engines that failed, it was the boosters and the heat tiles and the wing leading edge, are a gold standard for reliability and power that NASA wants to preserve even after the small inventory is used up. Yet the last enhancement to the engines was made in the 1990s and the new launch vehicle, uninspiredly named the Space Launch System, is expected to be the first one capable of sending humans beyond the moon. The contradiction between its design constraint, got to be built out of spare parts, and its ambitious mission, boldly go where no one has ever gone before, puts engineers like McDaniel in a tough spot. They are using space shuttle hardware for a vehicle tasked with a human spaceflight mission far more daunting than putting astronauts in orbit around the Earth. But you won't hear complaints at Stennis where the engines are tested or at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, where the SLS program is managed. Here we have an Aerojet Rocket 9 RL-10 cryogenic engine like the one above undergoing a hot fire test at Stennis Space Center. These will be used as the second stage propulsion for the Orion capsule on the first SLS flight. For later launches, NASA will buy a new second stage engine. If they can find somebody to buy one from. Down here, we see the four space shuttle main engines, which are the core of the first stage of the SLS. We see the space shuttle vintage rocket boosters to lift the fuel, which are going to power the four engines. We see the second stage, and we see the tiny little crew capsule that looks like a slightly overblown version 
of an Apollo capsule. And we even see that although the Saturn V that went to the moon is going to be bigger than the first launch of the SLS, eventually they hope to give it a padded condom on the nose to make it just a little bit bigger than a Saturn V rocket. We hear the SLS is being built partly with space shuttle hardware, partly with hardware, de hardware developed for Ares. I think Ares was the one George W. Bush was going to go to the moon on. Both are tested at the A3 test stand at Stennis. That's in that picture on the right side. And if we come across here, at Kennedy Space Center, technicians inspect space shuttle fuel tanks that might be used on the SLS. So they're literally polishing the relics in the museum. I'll just lift a piece out commencing here. A multi-purpose disposable vehicle, the SLS is sure to be expensive, but just how expensive is not yet known. Boeing is building two core stages under $2.8 billion contract. According to budget documents, the SLS program annually costs, annual cost is less than half that of the shuttle program, which ran to $4 billion annually in its last years. But the shuttle flew successfully 133 times over three decades and bracket, barring some political sea change, close bracket, the SLS isn't expected to launch more often than once every two years. The Government Accountability Office estimated the SLS's cost through the first launch at $12 billion and the total tab through 2020 at $22 billion. That's twice maybe three launches for $22 billion. But in July, the GAO warned that NASA would miss the 2017 launch unless the SLS program gets an additional $400 billion. So $400 million, not $100 billion. My mistake. The first SLS mission is a test. That's the one planned for this week. It will send an unmanned Orion capsule looping far around the moon and then back to Earth for a splashdown. The second mission, less firm. While some House members are urging that the second mission send a robot probe to explore Jupiter's moon Europa, which may harbour life beneath its frozen surface, NASA's current plan is to carry astronauts to visit an asteroid orbiting the moon. Bracket, a separate robot spacecraft would go out first, grab the rock, and then haul it into lunar orbit. Critics like former NASA Deputy Administrator Laurie Garver see the SLS as a red tape ridden reminder of old space from top to bottom. By the time NASA uses the SLS to go to Mars, Garva has said astronauts will be going there on 50-year-old technology. New space could do it better. She and others, like Congressman Dana Rohlbacker, say, pointing to newcomers like Elon Musk's space exploration technology SpaceX, which has used its Falcon 9 rocket for low-cost launches of cargo to the International Space Station and satellites to high orbits. We then go on to another page where they have more lovely photographs of really old technology, like space shuttle main engine computerized control modules, supersonic wind tunnels that are 30 years old to test a new rocket, adapter rings and fairings to join the upper stage to the second stage and the second stage to the first stage. If we start sampling the text from here. As NASA sees it, the SLS is precisely the sort of vehicle a country needs post-shuttle for a variety of missions. We're not building a one-of-a-kind spacecraft, says William Gersten Mayer, NASA Associate Administrator for Human Exploration and Operations. We're building hardware that can satisfy multiple needs. There's real work moving forward. This is no longer a paper program, unquote. Those 15 Space Shuttle main engines at Stennis are the most significant pieces of hardware that have helped the SLS move quickly beyond the paper stage. They were tested and improved throughout the 30 years the Space Shuttle flew. The first generation SSMEs were, quote, early in staged combustion and we were very close to the material limits on everything, end quote, says NASA's Mike Kynard, who recently retired as manager of liquid engines for the SLS at the Marshall Space Flight Center. The engines that replaced the original models are more powerful. Quote, at 1 million seconds of run time and 3,000 starts, we know it up one side and down the other, end quote, he says. With turbo pumps operating at 37,000 RPM, each turbine blade in the pump, though no bigger than a postage stamp, has to produce 600 horsepower, bracket, worth of torque, unclo close bracket, 
As reusable engines, with proven durability, they would have been capable of supporting many more shuttle launches. But on the SLS, these high-performance machines will be used just once and then dropped into the Atlantic to sink, along with the rest of the core stage and the strap-on boosters. Bracket, unlike in the shuttle era, the strap-ons won't be reused either. Close bracket. Quote, it's a misuse of those engines, says J.R. Thompson, former director of Marshall, who went on to head Orbital Sciences Corporation, which also delivers cargo to the space station. Thompson, now retired, was a key manager during the early years of the SSME development, a soul-trying period that saw 13 engines burn up or blow up during ground tests before 1983. Quote, I am not a fan of the SLS, unquote, he tells me over breakfast in Huntsville. It has no mission. It costs way too much. It's driven by political decisions. It's a job program. In my view, there's no enthusiasm in the country for it. Because journalism likes to be balanced, they put the opposite view. One private non-profit is trying to boost enthusiasm for the SLS at the, as the most practical way to reach Mars soonest. The, quote, Inspiration Mars Foundation, unquote, asked NASA to aim for a 2021 launch window. Quote, it's a good thing the SLS is being developed, unquote, says Tabor McCallum, the foundation's chief technology officer. Quote, I didn't frankly start off as an SLS supporter in this, and I came around to being one, unquote. Well, I guess he's come around to being one, and there's a picture of him there. And uh, <clears throat> he's sitting inside the only privately built life support chamber in the world. But yeah, he's come around to being a supporter because he badly needs a skyrocket to put his mission on. And he's noticed that NASA doesn't actually have any clear idea on what they want to set as a mission goal for the skyrocket they're trying to build. Here we see Marshall's Curtis Manning holding a five inch plastic model of a rocket engine, which is to power the Orion capsule. And he wants to build valve parts of it with his 3D printer. Here's a picture of the actual J2X engine undergoing cold flow tests. NASA will need that much power, i.e. 150 tonnes of thrust, if it ever decides to evolve the SLS into its largest configuration for trips to Mars. Meanwhile, the biggest problem for the SLS is less technical than political. In the coming decades, will there be enough politicians willing to support such an expensive space beast, or will historians eventually class it with the one-flight Soviet shuttle Buran? Will the SLS be reserved for politically charismatic missions such as putting boots on Mars, or can it boost robot voyages as well? With the first crewed mission not expected before 2021, there's time to work out mission goals and the manifest. If the schedule and the will hold, NASA will have something it's never had before, a system capable of slinging humans, habitats and robot explorers far beyond the moon and into deep space. So there we have, if, 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 but, maybe, perhaps, assuming somebody can find the funding. And this, as promised, is the manned manoeuvring unit flying untethered 300 feet, 100 yards away from the space shuttle in February 1984. Biggest, longest, furthest free flight by anybody in the history of space flight. And I spent 20 odd years developing it. I think it flew on three missions. The one time they tried to use the manned manoeuvring unit to secure a satellite and bring it back to the cargo bay for repairs. Somebody forgot to draw in a spigot on a spindle that blocked the grabbing attachment mechanism and therefore it didn't work. So they flew the space shuttle over and grabbed it with the space shuttle's robotic arm instead. So like I said, all kitted out in a lovely party dress with no dance to attend. Because you need a space shuttle's cargo bay to have somewhere to store the thing. So back to the 1960 Rockwell International guidance system for a Minuteman atomically armed missile. And the reason why these things are still in use today is because they are completely self-contained, they have no guidance signal from the ground, and therefore they are unjammable. Fire and forget, 1960 technology. So, like I said, the Americans have forgotten how to go to the moon, and can somebody please explain to me why using museum pieces is considered to be progress? Warbles on a lot of YouTube. Ciao.